will uh, start on uh, time. We're going to hear presentations from each of our uh, three presenters and also from the chair of the CARP Nova Scotia uh, uh, Financial Security Committee, Roy Hayward. So uh, Roy, I uh, invite you to uh, introduce yourself and go ahead. Well, welcome everybody. On behalf of CARP Nova Scotia, and as Bill said, as chair of the Financial Security Advocacy Committee, uh, I welcome you to this webinar on scams and frauds. Unfortunately, uh, these topics have been in the news too much lately, mm -hmm. seniors especially uh, being defrauded or scammed in some way of millions of dollars across Canada and in our own communities. So the purpose of this webinar is to bring awareness to this growing problem as to as many seniors as possible. To achieve this, I am pleased to introduce you to our three panelists. First of all, Lisa Bennett. Lisa, if you'll wave there, Lisa. Uh, she's Senior Safety uh, Coordinator for Lunenburg uh, County in Nova Scotia. Uh, Andrew Joyce of the RCMP. And David Harrison from the Nova Scotia Securities Commission. Welcome, David. Now, our panelists will show you how to identify, report, and stop scams and frauds. And of course, you, most of you know Bill Van Gorder, who is our moderator today. And Bill is a chief policy officer of CARP National and past chair and member of the board of CARP Nova Scotia. So Bill, over to you. Good, well, thank you very much, uh, Roy, and uh, also a thank you to, thanks to you and CARP Nova Scotia for supplying this webinar that is being seen right across the country and is available to all 330,000 members of the uh, CARP uh, uh, across, across the country. So we have a lot to cover today. I'm going to get right into it. And we're going to begin with a presentation from Lisa Bennett. Lisa, go ahead, please. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for sharing space with us today um, to learn more about this important topic. Um, I am going to show, no, I did this before and it was fine. Try it again. We did this in practice and it went good. Hey, no, they're coming. There you go. There we go. Um, so everyone can see that, I hope. Yes, we can. Yes. Awesome. So it's all about fighting fraud together because once you're separated from your money, it's very hard to get it back. Um, the I am with, as um, folks have said before, with Lunenburg County Senior Safety. There we go. Um, newly coordinator for the Lunenburg County. Our senior safety program helps with navigating systems, one-on-one -on -one services, education and awareness and advocacy, um, but we're not unique in this county. We have 16 different programs throughout Nova Scotia covering 16 counties. Um, and the services are free. So anyone can partake of that. And unfortunately, hearing about fraud and scams has been more prevalent in the, in the last month or so. Um, there's different types of scams that we've been hearing about. Um, during COVID, there was a lot of door-to-door -door scams. People, um, not really door-to-door, -door, but more of looking at home repair scams. The huge issue that we're having now is with telephone and internet scams. Um, looking at trying to have folks pay for different things that they shouldn't have to pay for. They go by using a, your emergency urgency in your high emotions for separating you from your money. And one of the I think we all seen on uh, CBC, the grandparent scam. So people are tricked out of 
large sums of money in order to help a friendly mem family member in trouble. It could be a car accident or legal problems or they need to get back into the country. There could be variations on that. A lot of times it's your grandson or your granddaughter. Um, go buy me some iTunes cards and we can you know, scratch off of the back of it, give me the number and that will pay, that we'll get the money that way, it's easy. What they don't know is that if they go to the consulate, if they're in another country with a problem, that consulate can help them out. It is, <clears throat> excuse me, a very huge issue um, in Lunenburg County with the grandparent scam. Um, another uh, method is uh, an e-transfer or a wire transfer. And it's become, as you said, as I said earlier, a, um, a bit of a, a large issue. Another one that has come up recently in the last couple of weeks that I've been trying to assist older adults with is the online rom a romance scam. So this again plays on emotion, but it also plays on the vulnerability of loneliness and isolation. It's usually drawn out from a large period of time. Um, they also say, that they are in need of money. They may need a car repair or uh, help with um, some kind of a bill or an urgent cost or an illness. Again, they're asked, seniors are asked to buy iTunes cards or gift cards and send that, in, that to them. And that's not traceable. We can't, once that's gone, it's gone. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and there's been a couple of, instances of using uh, Bitcoin. This is drawn out by building trust, a relationship, even though you haven't met the person they're looking, you're looking at those really deep emotional connections. And they feel like that, you know, no one knows me like you do. No one trusts me like you do. I don't trust anyone but you. You're the only one that can help me. That's type of so that's the type of thing that they they uh, present with themselves. Another thing that we've noticed in recent weeks here in um, the county, and then I'm pretty sure this is true across Canada, probably into the United States as well, the buying and selling scams. Um, I've heard one recently about someone being defrauded of a down payment for an apartment because you know they. You give me a down payment. This is the beautiful apartment. They haven't gone to see the apartment, um, but we need the down payment to secure it because housing is is so prevalent. It's, it's scared. It's scarce. Sorry. Um, then what happens is they go to that closing date, like they're going to move in. They're ready to move in, and there isn't an apartment, even though they've seen pictures of it, maybe even a video of what the apartment looks like, but that apartment doesn't exist. That's the larger scale, but it can happen with any of those other small merchandises that you can only do, they, they only will accept an e-transfer. They won't deal with cash. They, you know, they set up times to meet, but they don't show up. So that's another issue. So how do we protect ourselves? Um, oh, sorry, got ahead of myself. Email scams. So, how do you recognize an email scam? And I'm sure that um, folks can, whoops, I apologize. There we go. Um, when we're looking at emails and we get the <laughs> websites and emails can be spoofed or morphed where they look legit. But if you hover over the email address, you can see that it's different, that it's not legit. It could be a, a lot of different numbers uh, and variations or so. But if you click, on, without clicking on it, you can see that there's a difference. You'll often see spelling mistakes. Um, it'll address you as things like, instead of by your first name, say if it came from the Royal Bank, it will say, dear customer, if it's fake, but if the Royal Bank is really reaching out to you, 
it will give you your number or your name. They will use your name. And there's an example of it, of one that you can look at. Um, anything with a link, not a good idea to click on if you just, I'm sorry, I'm getting all confused with myself. I apologize. Um, if you're clicking on a link, that can give them access to your information, to your computer. So you need to be careful of that. <clears throat> If you look at um, the spelling or any differentiations of it, um, they can also, it, that can be an indicator that it's not true. So um, read the document carefully. Take the time to review what you're seeing, whether it's in a text or an email or even a regular mail. Is this legit? Ask questions. including looking for spelling errors. So ask yourself, does it make sense? Is what you're looking at legit? Is it real? iTunes cards and gift cards, if, if they're asking for payments through that method, chances are it's not legit. Um, don't give money to get money. Contest winning is another scam that we've seen from time to time that you give me five bucks or 500 bucks we have as a as a secure then we have two hundred and fifty thousand dollars waiting for you or five million waiting for you just give me some money in return and we can release those funds what i've seen in um two cases here recently was has been and it was brought to the attention, my attention by the, the local authorities too, that money, you don't give money to get money returned. So the, someone's been victimized by a scam artist, which they're very good at. They spend every waking moment looking at different ways of trying to um, relieve you of your money. You've realized you've been scammed and you try to get your money back or hoping to get your money back. Another part of that scam is they can connect, contact you in a different way um, saying, hey, I heard you lost some money. If you give me this money, I can help give you your money back. Not true. You don't give, you don't give more money to retrieve lost money. Um, and basically if something is too good to be true, Chances are it is too good to be true. So take your time and don't be click happy like I was just earlier. <laughs> Read, ask questions, understand. If someone's asking, calling you and saying that a relative is in trouble and they need financial help, get contact information. Call the, the individual that they're talking about or that individual's parents. So if it's your grandson, call the mother, find out if that's true. Um, get details in writing um, if you can and have a callback number. So if you get a phone call saying that you need to, um, trying to think of an example off the top of my head and I can't, sorry. If, if you need to um, reach out to them or they want more information from you, um, say it's another bank, a banking institution, you know who you bank with. So giving, calling the number that you're familiar with instead of clicking on any links that's, um, or addressing their calls. And check for other sources, get references. If you're looking at um, folks for repairing something in the, uh, in the home, Get references, check their references, find out that they are legit, see if they have insurances. Um, don't give out all your money up front. Be mindful of the fact that a little bit of a down payment may be necessary, but don't pay for the full service up front before the work is done. Um, see examples of the worst of that work if possible. Um, and definitely, like I said, check the references.
and sharing info with someone you trust. Um, what I mean by that is, if you are dealing, if a banking institution or um, an insurance company is reaching out to you, reach out to the people that you normally reach out to. Who is your regular contact in those institutions or in those businesses? and verify the information that's coming through. If you're getting repeated calls from a scam or um, repeated taxes, you can definitely block those. But if it's a phone call, it's very okay to hang up. We have been brought up not to be rude, but it's very okay to just hang up the phone. If you've been a victim of scam, or a scam, it's hard not to feel embarrassed and it's hard not to want to keep that to yourself, but it's important to share that and to let people know, not just around you so that they're not, sca not, they're not scammed as well, but report it to the Anti-Fraud Center or the Competition Bureau or even the Better Business Bureau because they're tracking scams as well. I did a presentation with them uh, just last week locally here and they were saying that even though it gets more news about older adults being scammed, it's actually a younger generation that's getting scammed more frequently. Unfortunately, it's the older adult that are losing larger parts of money, larger amounts of money. Um, you can use the national do not call list to register your phone number. And I've had mixed messages about how effective that really is. I've had some people say that they don't get repetitive calls um, from telemarketers and, and alike. And I've had others say the reverse. They ended up getting more calls. So I'm not sure what, what to say on that, but we do, we do have offer that as an option. And of course, call the local police. No, I feel like I've really speed talked um, but I do thank you for, for sharing space with me. And it's just, it's not about being scared. It's about being aware. And if we're vocal and honest and open about getting supports for when we are scammed, um, it helps somebody else from being scammed. Good. Well, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Uh, very much uh, appreciate uh, that. Some very good uh, information there and I know especially people who are in your part of uh, Nova Scotia will know enough to reach out to you if they have further questions. Now we're going to move to Andrew Joyce and Andrew I'm not going to take a lot of time introducing you but ask you if you would tell us a little bit about uh, yourself who you are and what you do and launch into your presentation. Andrew Joyce. Sure uh, thanks very much. Uh... For having me once again. Um, I just want to get things just a little lined up here so I can present what I have here. Um, just give me one second. Sorry, guys. I think if you click from the beginning in the corner there, I think that works. There you are. Now we're just seeing your uh, your your main screen, uh, Andrew. Right. We can see your screen, but we can't hear you. Right, okay, I'm just having a little there difficulty here, just not doing what I want it to do for me, but uh, anyway, we'll have to work around that. Uh, uh, sorry for the technical difficulty there, guys, but basically- There, there you are, it's moving now. Yeah, I'm here today, basically, I don't want really to alarm anybody, but if you are alarmed, um, uh, there's probably reason for it. Um, uh, Lisa's presentation was uh, was great. So everything everything that she said, uh, I, I certainly agree with. 
Uh, it's a hard act to follow. Um, I'll try not to repeat anything uh, that she has uh, shared with you today. And at least I thank you for, for that detailed presentation. Um, I'm going to go into basically some numbers for you all uh, to let you know what this problem is and uh, basically get a feel for how big the problem is. Uh, last year when I spoke with you, uh, we had basically frauds from the previous year of $2.5 million in Nova Scotia. This past year of 2022, it went up $1.1 million to $3.6 million. In Canada last year, in 2022, it was over a half a billion dollars, if that's correct, B. Billion with a B. Um, so what is what is the uh, what is the solution? Well, we're, we we may get into some discussion about that, but what this here uh, what what the problem is certainly in Nova Scotia, or is a list of uh, of frauds, various frauds that uh, that uh, we have been encountering. Uh, Lisa went into detail on on some of them. Uh, I suspect David is going to go into some detail on the investment ends of it all. These here frauds, what I'm finding in 30 years in this here business is that they remain somewhat the same. They may change places a little bit. Right at the very bottom or near the bottom of, of the list, it's called the emergency or the grandparent scam that Lisa spoke of. That's, uh, I guess, number 10 here in our list. I think it's going to be a little higher in 2023 as we got pretty hammered pretty hard, certainly here in the Halifax area, uh, initially to start the year off. I would suspect that we're well over well over the amount for the full year of last year, just on the on the grandparent scams alone. Um, so some may ask, well, how is Nova Scotia doing? Nova Scotia do, is doing relatively well compared to the rest of the rest of the country. We're losing basically about uh, slightly over three dollars per person in, in the province whereas the rest of the country is uh, slightly over $13 per person. So relatively speaking, compared to BC, Alberta, Ontario, we're, we're doing fairly well. Now, when I say well, I, I, I mean that uh, in com comparatively speaking, um, losing $1 to these hair fraudsters, in my opinion, is $1 too much. So some might say, well, $3.6 million, for the whole province, yeah, that's bad, but it's not that bad. Well, I'm here to tell you today that it is bad. And what makes it bad is studies have shown that for somebody who is a victim of a fraud, only between 5 and 10% of those persons actually report it. Five to ten percent. So what does that mean? Well, that means that ninety to ninety-five percent of the people who are defrauded are not reporting it. Somebody that has a calculator handy can get it out, and they're going to arrive at these numbers. So somewhere between three point six million dollars and 324 million dollars is what Nova Scotians lost to fraud in the year 2022. What would 324 million dollars do for our province? What would 47 billion dollars do for our country? That is what is being lost to scammers in this country, somewhere between those numbers that I provided you initially at 3.6 in Nova Scotia to 324 million in Nova Scotia. Those are amazing numbers, just amazing numbers in my opinion. I would think most of you would agree. Those numbers are, they're not my numbers, they're not the RCMP numbers, they're not uh, Halifax Police's numbers, but all of those, all of our numbers combined that were reported to the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. Canadian Anti-Fraud Center can be reached at the information here that I've uh, supplied to you on the screen. 
Their slogan is no fraud. It's kind of a cute little slogan, which they're asking you to recognize, reject, and report. Reject and report, that's a pretty easy one. We can do that. We're learning now how to, how to do that, how to, how to contact them or how to contact the police and report it. It's the recognize part that us humans seem to be having trouble with. I unfortunately have 15 minutes to talk to you today. I can't get into that detail, although we spoke of it the last time we met last year of how to recognize a fraud. I'd be very, very happy to return, if so invited, to get into more detail of speaking about how to recognize it. Today, I want to talk more about the problem. Or if in your community, you can get a group together of 20 or more people, I'd be happy to come to your community in person and speak to you about what I'm speaking about today and also how to recognize a fraud. Who is the fraudster? Who are they? Well, they're smart, they're sophisticated, they're articulated, articulate rather, they're tech savvy, and they're often the person who you want that person to be. They're almost always all of those things that I listed. How can one person be all those things? How is that possible? As police, what we are finding, we envision the person that has defrauded us or that is attempting to defraud us as having an appearance of who they are. Here's what we're actually finding. These persons are not one person. They are an organized power group from all over the world. Do they have persons here in Canada? Absolutely they do. Do they have persons elsewhere in the world? Yes, they do, most certainly. They have people that specialize in certain skills, social media skills, salesman type skills, fast talkers, people that, uh, that are able to win your trust. Very, very skillful at what they do. Very skillful of honing in on what pushes you or presses your buttons and gets your attention. They specialize in different things, various types of frauds, various types of ID thefts. They have an ability to seek out what you were able to provide and obtain it. So what I want you to take from that is this often is not a single person on the other end of that phone call, text message, or email. You get the feeling that it's only one person and they want you to believe that it's just one person, but it often it is not. Who's the victim? The victim of course can be a business, many times it is, and of course it can be a person. Person, if you have identification, if you have a social insurance number, having money is nice. Having a bank account is useful. And if you're able to travel, hey, they got a use for that too. So, what does that mean? Well, that means if you have any one of those traits, you are a potential victim. Got a SIN number? Of course you do. 
Got a little money in your bank account? Oh, you don't? Oh, okay, but do you have a bank account? And if the answer to that is yes, well, they got a use for that. They would like to use it. Able to travel? Good. They'll use you in that way as well. With all these billions of dollars being lost, who's going to save us? Who's, 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 who's going to stop this? Oh, that's not a very good slide. Sorry about that. That's supposed to represent the government. Government going to save us? We live in a great country. We have a great charter that protects us from many things, from police basically uh, going in and looking at all our private private documents and we that kind of thing. Like our, our privacy laws are are pretty strong. So maybe we could ask the government to get rid of the charter, therefore, so it will make it easier for the police to uh, to you know find these fraudsters and put them in jail. Do we want to do that? We want to get rid of our charter, the thing that probably makes this country probably the best country in the world. Is that a good idea? What about the police? How about them? Are they going to they going to uh, throw all these fraudsters in jail? How have they done so far? Getting those calls every day, getting fewer calls today than you got yesterday, or fewer calls this year than you got last year. Are we seeing fewer victims? Well, I just showed you we're getting more victims. We're losing more money. Well, what about giving the police all these powers to allow them to go down and any person at all that they choose, they can go to the bank and say, yeah, I want all the records on this here guy. I want all the details and, you know, they just give the police all the powers that we can. Or how about, well, you know, the police can tag up with our government and, and, and do all that. If we do all of that, I mean, I don't know what effect that would have, but my guess is that we might put a dent in, into uh, what's going on here by about 10%. So instead of uh, losing 3.6, definitely 3.6 definite million last year, we could be only, what's 10% less of that? I don't know, just, just, over, just over 3 million. Does that really, that really uh, make things better? Not really a whole lot, does it? I think we're all in agreement with that. What's the answer? During this here, a little bit of uncomfortable silence, I expect you guys to be thinking and saying, okay, what the heck is he talking about? He's saying, well, uh, at least they haven't really done a great job so far. And the government really can't do anything for us, so... What the heck are we going to do? I think the African saying is it takes a village to raise a child. The only answer in 30 years that I can think of is you. We have to educate ourselves. We have to know fraud. We have to learn to recognize it. Learning to recognize it will give us the ability to reject it. And then, of course, possibly report it. Those are the slogans from the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center. I just lifted them from their site. I suggest anyone 
has any interest in wanting to protect yourself and learning about fraud, to go to the website, the Canadian Anti-Fraud Centre. On their homepage, you will see what we see before you now. Going across about a, a, an inch and a half, two inches down, you'll see a couple, four different blocks, browse scams, protect yourself, report a fraud, and what to do if you're a victim. Click in any one of those that give you interest. I suggest you click in all of them. You'll find loads of information. It'll, there's over 100 scams that they talk about in there. They talk about many of the scams that Lisa was talking to you earlier about. They get into great detail of it, as much detail almost as you, as you need to know or ever wanted to know. Ideas on how to protect yourself. Of course, how to report it. And depending on the type of fraud that, you, that you've been a victim of, what to do because there are different things that you should do depending on the fraud that you've been victimized to. Down at the very bottom of that website, it again it talks about the scams like from A to Z. So, so under uh, an emergency scam, we can just go, go to the letter E, you find different types of scams under the letter E, that kind of thing. It's just, just a host of information. It tells you, it gives you current figures, uh, one of the figures there, for instance, uh, October 31st, 2022, uh, the, the figure that they have of the police actually recovered from, uh, from uh, people who were victimized. Now, this is for Canada. Remember that for the whole year, it was more than a half a billion dollars. Police recovered almost probably, probably by the end of the year, just over $3 million. Three million compared to a half a billion, that ain't very good. We ourselves are the best protection against this here crime. My time is running out. I'm a little over. I apologize. But I hope to talk to you at some point on how to recognize frauds. I have five things, only five things, that if you know these things, any fraud that you hear of, you're able to apply all of these five simple things to. And I'd love the opportunity to, again, talk to you about that in detail and how to protect yourselves and how to recognize a fraud. 99% of the frauds that I have seen in 30 years Knowing these five things will give you the ability to recognize an event that somebody is trying to de defraud you when you encounter it. I thank you very much. That's it for me. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Sergeant uh, Andrew Joyce. And uh, I'm sure we will take you uh, up on your offer to uh, visit with us uh, all all again and there will be some opportunity of course at the end of the next presentation for our viewers to ask questions and i'm sure uh, there will be some uh, for you now we're going to move on to uh, david harrison david is with the securities commission uh investor education and communication officer we've had a tremendous number of comments and complaints from CARP members about the their worries about their safety of their investments. So, uh, uh, David, we're hoping that uh, you can uh, help us recognize the frauds and, and possibly put some minds at ease. So, uh, David Harrison, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, Bill, for the introduction. Uh, thank you for Andrew and Lisa for uh, getting things started. I'll try not to repeat uh, much of what they said, but um, uh, for anyone who doesn't know, the Nova Scotia Securities Commission is the provincial securities regulator. Uh, we regulate investments in the province of Nova Scotia, and we also investigate investment fraud as well. Uh, so one of the uh, large misnomers around investment fraud that people send, team, some tend to have is that you have to be have a lot of money to become a victim of investment fraud. And uh, unfortunately, that's 
uh, we we know that's not the case, just from what we've discovered over the last number of years. Uh, for example, in 2021, uh, according to the Anti-Fraud Center, uh, the median loss for invest reported investment fraud in this country was only $1,900. Uh, so again, you don't need to be a rich person to potentially be a victim of investment fraud. Uh, that being said, due to uh, a large, tremendous increase in large forms of investment fraud in 2021, that number did jump a lot in 2022 to approximately $18,000. Uh, again, though, that being said, uh, you do not need to have to have a considerable sum of money to be taken advantage of by a fraudster that uh, uh, creates in investment fraud. Uh, and as Andrew was talking about with numbers across country, back in 2021, according to the Canada, Canada Anti-Fraud Center, uh, re reported losses from investment fraud in this country were just under $164 million. And I, I suppose what Andrew said around uh, the number of reported fraud. Uh, as he said, the numbers of report of fraud are considered to be very low, uh, so we consider that number to only be a small dent in the actual losses during that year. Uh, when it comes to uh, investment fraudsters targeting seniors, uh, they'll target seniors that have a lot of money or don't have or have very little money, and they do that in two different ways typically. Uh, for example, they will target retirees that have built up a considerable nest egg uh, with other potential opportunities for investment. Uh, to try and continue to grow that nest egg as they move along in their life. Uh, but they'll also target people that uh, using tactics around fear of not having enough uh, saved for retirement. And they'll unfortunately play upon those fears to get them to invest in things that are fake securities, or fraudulent companies, for example. Uh, so just to be known, uh, even no matter which uh, bucket you fall under, if you have a considerable retirement nest egg, or if you are afraid you don't have enough ret to retire, you can unfortunately be targeted by people uh, pilfering investment frauds. Uh, on the screen now, you'll see two of the most famous fraudsters. Uh, both are very famous for uh, pulling off what are known as Ponzi schemes. Uh, on the left there, or my left anyway, and the black and white photo, that would be Charles Ponzi. You may be familiar with that name, but the, the Ponzi scheme is coined after. Uh, back in the 1920s, Mr. Ponzi uh, stole approximately 20 plus million dollars from his investors. Uh, $20 million is a considerable amount of money today, and $20 million is even a lot more money back in the 1920s. Uh, the man in the color photo there, you may also be familiar with his name, Bernie Madoff. Uh, Bernie Madoff is considered to have uh, orchestrated uh, what is considered to be the largest financial uh, fraudulent scheme in the history of finance, uh, bilking his clients out of approximately $64 billion by running a lengthy, long Ponzi scheme uh, through his investment firm. Uh, one thing to be uh, cognizant of when we talk about uh, Charles Bondi stealing $20 million or Bernie Madoff stealing $64 billion, uh, they didn't steal exactly that amount of money. Uh, what we mean by that, and what can make investment fraud typically, especially heinous, is someone will uh, give uh, a large or a small amount of money to a fraudster potentially. And by doing so, they're expecting to increase that amount of money sometime in the future. For example, in the Madoff case, a lot of people invested for their retirement with him. So for example, say I wanted to invest $100,000 with Bernie Madoff, and I expect in 30 years from now, I'm gonna have $30 million to retire on. Uh, so in essence, what he's basically doing is he's stealing your money today, that $100,000 you invest with him, as well as the money you expected to have in the future. So he's not only investment, people that are pill for investment frauds, not only are taking people's money uh, away from them uh, currently, but they're also taking their potential dreams and hope to the future as well, which can leave people in very uh, precarious situations, uh, not only today, but especially in the future when they go to look for that money and it's not even there. Uh, some of the common scams and frauds we, uh, our investigators come up against a lot, to things like Ponzi schemes. Uh, the way a Ponzi scheme typically works is someone will, uh, you'll invest with someone running a Ponzi scheme and they, they will not invest any of that money but they will provide you some kind of return that they promise for you. And they'll do so to try and gain your trust to continue to have you investing money with them. Uh, the way upon the scheme, to continue upon the scheme, someone has to have money continually coming in to pay out investors their returns. Uh, what uh, the investors don't know, obviously, is that, for example, in the Madoff situation, in the Charles Ponty situation, the money that they weren't investing from their investors, they're using to fund very lavish lifestyles, whether that be buying houses, cars, trips, uh, other lavish lifestyle uh, purchases. 
Uh, and then eventually too many people will come for their money. For example, a bunch of people are investing for retirement and what end up be a Ponzi scheme. They'll go to have their money withdrawn and will end up finding just vacant accounts. Uh, some of the other common scams or frauds we encounter include infinity fraud. Infinity fraud is exactly uh, a, a type of fraud. What it is, is when someone targets a specific group or community uh, and they use the, and they're actually already part of that community. So they use the trust that they've built up over years within that community to unfortunately take advantage of people um, because uh, someone will offer an investment opportunity in a ethnic group that they've never heard of, or we've seen this happen in churches a lot, unfortunately. And because this person is a member of the church community, for example, uh, people believe they can trust them with their money. And unfortunately, as I said, people profiling in affinity fraud use that trust that they built up to take advantage of people in that community. Uh, a boiler room scam is a, way, is a scam we've seen occasionally where someone will create a fake company and basically sell securities or investments in it. Uh, and they will go to great lengths to do so, uh, including things such as creating fake paperwork, fake statements, fake websites, fake email addresses, to make people believe this, this, co this co uh, sorry, company is legitimate and a worthwhile investment. And unfortunately, the people that do invest in this company that doesn't exist in the first place often will, uh, will end up losing their money because the people will just disappear with it. Uh, pump and dump scams is a uh, way to inflate uh, the purchase, uh, the price of a potential stock, for example. Uh, um, since we're in short on time, I'm going to go over these very slowly, quickly. But if you have more questions about them, feel free to ask me at the end of the presentation or, or send me an email or other communication. I'd be glad to answer more in-depth questions about any of them. Uh, Barney options at one point were one of the most widely known investment scams in this country, but uh, thanks to cooperation through securities regulators and uh, law enforcement, uh, we've seen a dramatic decrease in it over the last number of years. Uh, but at one time, it was uh, people outside of Canada, a lot of them in uh, Middle East, Eastern Europe, parts of Asia, were offering trading options. Uh, trading uh investments in these fake binary options platforms which cause considerable losses for considerable canadians across this country in the hundreds of thousands of dollars uh with the decrease decrease in binary options uh, scams we've unfortunately seen especially in the last five to six months to a year a large increase of people using cryptocurrencies and icos and crypto assets uh to run types of investment scams and i'll talk about a, a one that we've seen uh, not only here in Nova Scotia, but across North America over the last few months on the next slide. Uh, recovery room scams, as, as Lisa mentioned previously, is when someone who has been victimized previously is taken advantage of again by someone coming forward and saying uh, they can potentially help get their money back uh, if they were offered some kind of fee. Uh, the way this typically works sometimes is they'll be contacted by someone who may be impersonating an RCMP officer or a police officer, someone at a bank, or some kind of securities regulator uh, saying that they've come across, they've caught the fraudster that defrauded them and they found their money hidden away in some kind of offshore account or uh, and to reach this money, they'll have to pay some kind of release fee. Uh, what the person doesn't know is typically the person contacting them is usually the fraudster that they potentially are dealing with already, or it could be someone that the fraudster passed on their information to, uh, to try and take advantage of again. Uh, if you were if you pay this person this fee or pay this money in any way, uh, typically you will not receive that money your money back, and they will just unfortunately be taking advantage of you all over again to unfortunately take more money from you. Uh, some ways you can watch out some of the red flags you can look for to help spot investment fraud. Uh, we have five of them here. Um, not all of these appear in every type of investment fraud, but typically one or the two of them do stand out, which, help you, which you can hopefully recognize and hopefully avoid potentially being defrauded. Uh, the number one being you were promised a high return for low risk. If, if you can remember just one thing I talk about today, if you can remember that anything that is considered to be a high return, low risk investment is almost 99%, 99.9% of the time will be fraud. Uh, you cannot have the opportunity for high returns without risk increasing along with it. One, if one goes up, the other goes up as well. You can't have one without the other. So if someone is offering you an investment opportunity and promising you a high return for low or no risk, uh, do not give that person your money. Run away because there's a good chance if you do, you will never see that money again. Um, another major red flag of our investment fraud is high pressure tactics, making people act now, setting a time limit on when people must invest at a certain time. Uh, typically, fraudsters do not want to give you time to think anything over. They want to separate you from your money as quickly as possible. 
uh, so they can get away from you with it. Uh, if someone is not giving you the opportunity to think about making an investment, the re typically the reason for that is because if you did think about it long enough, you likely would not invest. Uh, so if someone does not give you the opportunity to either ask questions or provide answers that are, are up to your standard, uh, do not give that person your money because again, there's a good chance you'll probably never see it again. A uh, third red flag is you'll be given confidential or inside information. Uh, one of the problems with confidential information is there's typically no way to verify that it's, uh, if it's true or not or real. And if you're being inside information, that could potentially be insider trading or some of the kind of illegal activity, which could not only put you in, in trouble, but also the person offering to you as well. Uh, number four, there's no credible sources that can validate the investment. Um, we mentioned boiler rooms earlier about people offering securities or investments in, in, in uh, companies that no, don't even exist. If you cannot verify the, uh, uh, validate or verify the source of the investment outside of the person offering it to you, uh, for example, you can't find any information about it outside of the information provided to you, whether it be a website or some kind of other documentation, uh, there's a good chance that may be a fraudulent or fake investment. And that again, investing in such a thing will probably end up costing you a lot of money. Uh, and lastly, one of the major red flags is the firm or advisor or person offering you the investment opportunity is not registered. Uh, to offer or advise on even securities in the province of Nova Scotia, you must be registered with the Nova Scotia Securities Commission to legally do so. And you can easily check this by going to a website where you can find a link to the National Registration Search Database, uh, which has a list of everyone registered in this country to offer and author, uh, advise on and sell securities. Uh, so if someone offering you investment opportunity is not registered, that means they have no oversight by regulators like us, uh, which means we don't know what they're offering is legitimate or real to begin with. Uh, so if someone isn't registered and they don't give you a good reason why, again, that's a good red, a red flag that they may be pilfering an investment fraud. Uh, earlier this year in January, we issued a, an investor alert uh, through media and on our website about a a prevalent cryptocurrency scam that we've seen here, not only here in Nova Scotia, but has been widely seen across North America. Uh, and at the time over the past, between August and January uh, of last year and this year, uh, we know of at least uh, $750,000 that have been lost by Nova Scotians to this actual fraud. Uh, and since we issued this release, we know that, that, that amount has topped over the million dollar mark. And again, this is reported and as we've said earlier in the other two presentations, uh, investment fraud is very underreported. So we believe that number to be much higher than it actually is. Uh, this, the way this uh, very common scam has worked, it's very similar to a romance, romance type scam. A person will receive an unsolicited message, whether it be from text or some kind of messaging app, or they may click on a ad on Facebook or social media regarding crypto trading or um, other investing in crypto assets. Uh, and if they get an unsolicited message, that person will try and build up a relationship with them. And if they're successful in doing so, as someone down the line, they will try to talk to their new friend about how recently they have made a considerable amount of money investing on some kind of crypto asset. And they will try and talk their friend into investing uh, to help them make more money as well. And in our times of heightened inflation and uh, economic strife, uh, they're very good at talking people into investing to try and make themselves some extra money on the side. Uh, what they'll do, they'll provide them a link or some kind of software to download that will give, give them access to some kind of crypto trading platform that is unfortunately being run by the scammer that is talking to them. Uh, so what they'll do, they'll talk them into investing a small amount of money at first, maybe a couple hundred dollars, and then eventually, very, uh, probably less than a week later or in a short period of time, it'll provide them with an image or a bank statement or a, a crypto wallet uh, screenshot showing that that two hundred dollars they've invested has grown quite considerably in a short period of time to say a few thousand, uh, and this will make that person want to invest heavily even more into this crypto platform. And unfortunately, we've seen a lot of people take out uh, uh, direct monies for their credit card or invest through lines of credit to invest tens to hundreds of thousands in these crypto platforms that unfortunately do not exist. Uh, eventually, this person, these people will try to make some kind of withdrawal from these crypto trading platforms. And at that point, they'll be told that they have to pay some kind of fee or tax to release the money. Even if this fee or tax is paid, no withdrawal will be allowed or accepted or offered. And typically, the person that has been talking to them will disappear and ghost them, taking their money with them. And unfortunately, when it comes to uh, uh, crypto asset camps like this or other ones, 
tracking down the money can sometimes be not that difficult, but claiming it or reclaiming any money is typically almost impossible. So it is very difficult to reclaim any money lost in these types of scams. Uh, some of the uh, red flags you can watch out for crypto fraud, uh, potential crypto fraud include things like looking out for guarantees of high returns with little to no risk. Again, as we talked before, high returns and low risk do not go together. Uh, always refuse someone remote access to your computer. Uh, we've seen a number of people, unfortunately, not only lose considerable amounts of money this way, but also become victims of identity theft by offering other people access to their computer. Uh, be wary of crypto asset recovery offers, like the one Lisa mentioned earlier. Uh, don't invest in anything you can't understand. Uh, people use the uh, newness and the uh, complicate, complicated nature of these assets uh, to unfortunately take advantage of people that really don't understand what they're investing in to begin with. Uh, be mindful that requests for wire transfers or for crypto assets to be sent to other crypto platforms is un or unknown accounts is not normal and can be a way to unfortunately separate your money into places where you will not be able to retrieve it. And also, lastly, conduct your due diligence with any coin, token, or project around some kind of crypto asset you may be thinking about investing in. Uh, because unfortunately, we've seen tremendous amounts of fraud and a very much increase of fraud in these sectors in the last six to 12 months. Uh, lastly, around uh, another um, very prevalent investment uh, type fraud we've seen lately is people running what are known as kind of impersonation scams. And what they'll do, they use a famous face. For example, we've seen people use uh, ex Dragon Den people here in Canada. For example, on the screen there, we've seen Arlene Dickinson. They will use people's faces or, or supposed promotion or uh, news using them to potentially say they're interested in the offer that they're offering or they're behind that offer, for example. Uh, and it's not the case. These people have nothing to do with this, uh, they're just using their fame or their notoriety to unfortunately offer what are no, what are considered to be high and unprofitable scams. Uh, for example, in the middle there, we've also seen a, a unlisted YouTube video lately that uh, is a deep fake, fake video, uh, which uses a fake um, inter interview with Elon Musk, Elon Musk, sorry. This interview never took place. It is not real. It's, it's basically saying that Elon Musk is offering Canadians a way to invest in an AI platform he's created that is 99, 92% accurate when it comes to picking and buying stocks. So anyone investing in this platform is supposedly going to become very rich when in fact it doesn't exist in the first place. Uh, and this interview never actually took place. And last time we checked that video, which is unfortunately still appearing on YouTube, has over 440, 444,000 views with several comments of people asking for information about how they can invest and make a lot of money, which unfortunately means most people potentially have lost considerable amounts of money as well. Uh, and last, as, as, as Andrew and Lisa have said, remember, when it comes to investment fraud or fraud in general or anything in general, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. Uh, if you want more information about some of the things we've talked about, you can uh, go to the commission website at ncc.novascotia.ca. Uh, if you have any questions about things we've talked about today or anything beyond that around investment fraud or investing in general, uh, our basic email is there on the screen. Uh, uh, you can follow us on Twitter and Facebook and LinkedIn to see alerts and warnings that we issue uh, regularly around potential people offering what we, we believe is investment fraud in this province. Um, we also have a YouTube channel where you can see uh, short one to five minute videos on basics, investing things, and a lot about investment fraud there as well. Uh, so I will turn it over to Bill for the question and answer period. And thank you very much for inviting us and allowing to speak with you today. Well, thank you very much, David. That was a lot of really good uh, information and I know probably new to uh, some to some people. Uh, we, didn't, we're, we have about 20 minutes uh, left and we're going to invite you to put your questions in the chat and then I will ask them of the uh, panelists and we already have a number of questions there. Uh, we probably won't get to all the questions, we never do. Uh, but please continue to put them in the chat, because if you do, we will forward them. All of our uh, panelists have agreed to follow up. Any questions you have for them, we'll make sure that you get an answer, even if you don't get one uh, live, uh, uh, live today. So to uh, begin with, uh, as I say, a number of, uh, a number of questions that we've, uh, that we've had, to, uh, had today. And I'm going to uh, uh, begin uh, by going to the chat 
here. And David, you're still sharing. So i uh, see if I can get to my questions here. I'm seeing your chat, not mine. Uh, hmm. Just take a moment here to uh, get the questions. There we go. So the uh, the uh, first uh, the first question that we uh, uh, we had and a, a very uh, uh, good one uh, from Sandra of the Alzheimer's Society who said that and pointed out as many of us are, she was heart heartbroken with the frauds and scams that are happening and that she's aware many persons living with dementia are especially vulnerable. And she's hoping that someone on the panel can answer uh, when you report a fraud or a scam, uh, is it possible uh, uh, through the Canadian Fraud Center to find out what happened? Is there anything that can be done other than just gathering data? Who would like to take that one? Uh, Andrew, do you want to try that one? Sure. So the, the question is, if somebody reports uh, a scam, um, they they want are they a victim of this the actual scam? So they're reporting. Yeah, if they're if they're a victim or or the family of a victim, is there some way the Canadian Fraud Center can help them follow up and potentially get their money back? Well, uh, certainly you. I wouldn't go necessarily through the Canadian Antifraud Center. You certainly re maybe report it there, but you cert the the first line that I would do if you're scammed is report it to your local police, and then then the police have an obligation to to keep you informed of how the investigation is proceeding, or not. Good. Okay. Very good. Uh, this one might be for you, David. Uh, this person says their union was a victim of a data breach. And their name and email address and SIM number is now in the hands of criminals. Uh, this person was only told about it uh, five months after the fact. What can they do to protect themselves from identity theft, uh, theft? And also, they were told that that they should flag their accounts, but they're not sure what that meant and what what can they uh, do about. It. You know, there's been a bit of data breach. You mm -hmm. know that your information has been shared. What should you do? Uh, one thing I would do in that situation is set up some kind of credit monitoring service uh, for your credit to monitor your accounts and uh, basically know if anyone is ever applying for anything in your name, whether it be a credit card, line of credit, or some other type of uh, banking information, uh, as well as uh, I know I have it on my accounts, for example, uh, whenever whenever I use my credit card on my bank card for anything that's over $50, I get an immediate text, so I know when my account, my, my card has been used. Uh, so you may want to set up as many safe, fact, safe factors as that as you possibly can, as well as any account you may have had, uh, set up some kind of two-factor authentic, authentication, for example. Uh, what that means is if, even if you have, if they have your passwords, for example, uh, have it so you have some kind of set up two-factor on your phone or some other type of device uh, to better protect yourself so you know who's in your accounts and who's not. Good, thank you. Um, here's another one. Uh, uh, and uh, Lisa, this may be one that's of interest to you. This person's mother was engaged in a romance scam and it originated through Facebook. What are the steps that they can do to uh, report this? Has something done? Um, the police told her there was nothing that they could do. And she's wondering if there also, if there's any mental health supports or community supports for those who don't seem to be able to detach themselves from the fantasy of romance. That's a complex question. Um, this is. is where it gets into diving into those, tapping into those um, emotions of individuals who are feeling maybe a little isolated. And like we've all said before, they're telling you what they want you to hear to grab a hold. Um, definitely reach out to senior safety. Uh, there's different uh, mental health services in different communities that would be a benefit. Trying to uh, block the person from Facebook um, if the individual is open to that. So 
sometimes we have to ease into the conversation and do reality checks and fact checking on the people uh, that we care about so that we can help them understand that this isn't real, that this is this is make believe and, and that that's a hard pill to swallow. It's it, it involves sensitivity, but to monitor what's going out, are they, you know, if they are asking for this to send I cards or gift cards or Apple cards uh, to pay for something that's for somebody that I haven't even met, uh, for them to come back into the country or to pay for their son's surgery. Um, is that really how you would pay for something like that? So asking questions and, and supporting them with that. Good, thank you, Lisa. David, this one might be one for you. This person says that she's been getting calls from RBC saying they stopped payment on a credit card for a small amount and want to check if I authorized it. It sounded just like when my bank really did call, but in this case, she doesn't have an RBC credit card. So how can she tell the difference? Uh, it can be very difficult to tell the difference between what is a legitimate phone call sometimes and what it is not. Uh, if you ever have any, uh, if you think a call you are receiving may not be legitimate, uh, first thing is don't give them any personal or financial information. Uh, what you should do is say, um, thank you. I will give your organization a call back directly to make sure you're talking to the person you think you are. For example, I can call you and say, I'm calling from RBC and, and collect some personal information from you by um, saying something out of your credit card. But if you, if you have fears that the person you're talking to is not representing the actual organization, hang up the phone and call back that organization directly. Because uh, they receive phone calls like that all the time before just saying, uh, someone from your bank just called me to say this and said, no, no one from a bank is actually contacting you. So uh, make the connection yourself to ensure who you're actually talking to is the person that uh, being representative of who they are. Great, thank you. Uh, Andrew, I think this one's for- Yeah, if I could just add to that, yeah. what David had to say there, an unsolicited contact is what we call that. Uh, unsolicited contact plus your personal information or plus your money a lot of times equals fraud so as david suggested anytime you have a caller that you didn't call or, or somebody texting that you didn't text that unsolicited contact we advise as david has suggested to disconnect your your contact with that person politely and then recontact that person by a number that you have found by their official website, not the number or information that they provided to you on that contact. Good advice. Uh, a question also for you, uh, uh, Andrew. Uh, this person said, we are told to report scams, but never sure what to uh, uh, tell. They had a phone call from a number or a, a local number and said, uh, so what? Uh, what are, what's the sense of reporting it? I'm sure there are hundreds. Why would I bother to report it? Well, if you are not a victim of that fraud, yeah, I agree. I mean, how many calls? I think everybody in this here panel gets a, at least one call a week. So if every Canadian is getting at least one call a week, well, there's 30 million or so Canadians, and that's uh, you know uh, 52 weeks in the year. Uh, so I mean, you, the, the the authorities just can't handle that volume. They're just not set up for that volume. What we're suggesting that you do do is report it if you are, are an actual victim. If you gave up your personal information or if you gave up actual uh, money out of your pocket, then you are a legitimate victim. Um, otherwise, yeah, re, me, you can report uh, the information to the Canadian Anti Fraud Center. Uh, via their, their mechanisms that they have uh, through their website and that kind of thing, uh, by all means, if you feel it necessary to do so. But these, these common phone calls that, that you're getting numerous times a week um, and, and, and you haven't given up your personal information or money, yeah, yeah you're right. You're, you're, you're wasting your time and, and probably somebody else's on the other end. All right, uh, uh, David, back to you. Uh... The question is, when a senior person tries to transfer her retirement funds to a, West, uh, to a, uh, ma a managing agency, how's the best way to check out the agency? She says some of them aren't even recognized with the Better Business Bureau. 
Uh, so from understanding the question correctly, I assume this is, is transferring uh, some kind of investment um, account to another uh, agency. Right. That's, yes. If that, if that is if that is truly a question, uh, if if you're dealing with your investments, always make sure the person you're dealing with is registered, uh, not only. Uh, in the problems you're dealing with. For example, if you're here in Nova Scotia to uh, uh, be a person that is offering investment advice or services like that has to be registered with securities regulators here to do so. Now you can easily check that uh, by going to our website or the Canadian Securities Administrative website and going to the National Registration Search Database. Now there's a link on our website that says check registration that will take you directly there. Uh, when you're there, you can enter a person or a firm's name to find out if they are registered, what provinces they're registered in, and also things like their category of registration, which will tell you what kind of uh, securities and services they can offer to the public legally. Now, I kind of follow up question uh, to that, and that is what recourse is there to being defrauded by a registered investment advisor? There have been a number of high. Uh, value instances in Nova Scotia recently, including uh, one of a local personality that many of us were aware of. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you froze there, but um, well, if, if you have an issue with, this, if, with your advisor, whether it be um, a service issue or some kind of unfortunate theft or fraud issue, uh, you should report that not only to us as securities regulators, but to the police as well, potentially. Uh, not only us, our investigators can look into that, and their investigators potentially look into that as well uh, to determine, again, what exactly has happened to the situation and what uh, actions can be taken, uh, whether that be uh, uh, sanctions or penalties against that person or potentially criminal action as well, as well as if there's any money left over to potentially return to the victim if that's possible. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of the times when it comes to investment fraud, by the time the fraud is discovered, a lot of the time that money has been spent or transferred offshore or gone. And unfortunately, when there's no money left to begin with, uh, there's not a whole lot that can be returned to the victim in a lot of circumstances. Okay, thank you. That's uh, too bad. There's, and there's no, no insurance that you can buy against that or no insurance available? There are a few um, protective funds in this country, but it depends on if they are uh, situated to your current situation. It, it is go by case by case basis, depending on how that might work. So. Right. Uh, Lisa, I think this one uh, is one for you. If you think the email is a fraud, and if you just uh, delete it, should you also uh, report it? If you've opened it, can the fraudster still get access to your computer? I think you're on mute. So there yeah, you are. sorry about that. Just yeah. trying to keep the noise here in the station sure. down to a minimum yeah. from interfering. Um, if you are deleting it, they can't get access to your to your computer. If you're clicking on any of the links um, that they that are embedded within the email, um, then you run that risk of them having access to your personal information. Um, if I'm understanding the question correctly. Um, if you if you just opened it, I don't think that's an issue, but maybe Andrew or David can speak better to that. I think it's more of an issue if you're clicking the link that's inside of those. Yeah, sure. Maybe we'll tag team this one, guys. It, it, as Lisa had indicated, it all depends. Like if, if you uh, clicked on some uh, some links within the email, then yeah, you are going down that road. And if you are down that road and you're not comfortable with the, with your computer's uh, like your computer knowledge, I would suggest that you take your computer into uh, basically a brick and mortar shop uh, in your community and have a look at, and maybe explain to them maybe possibly what what you have done if you have some insecurities of of what has occurred. Uh, so it it really depends on the circumstance. Just opening up the email. Uh, should not create a problem, but clicking on links within the email could very well. Okay, thank you. Uh, David, I think this uh, one is for you, uh, and maybe uh, also Andrew to comment. This person says they have recently lost $400 to one of the Dragon's Den investment frauds. Says I can live with that, although I'm very surprised at myself for making that mistake. My concern is that uh, since I did that and gave the scam artist access to my computer, how do I prevent identity theft now? 
Uh, I can start with that if you like. Um, as I mentioned earlier around uh, setting up uh, credit checking monitoring services, uh, keeping a close eye on your accounts. And also uh, when you set up those ser account services, if someone uh, again uses your name to open an account or, or, act or a credit card or, your, or anything like that, you should get an alert of it. And that will give you, uh, the sooner you learn something like that, the better, because the longer it takes, the more money the person may uh, unfortunately bring up in your name or other or in other circumstances. Uh, if someone has access to your computer, uh, recommend disconnecting it from the internet as quickly as possible, because um, that will be the main way that they will potentially lift any information off of it to begin with. Something as simple as turning off your Wi-Fi access, for example, and then taking that to uh, some kind of computer expert to have them go over it to determine um, again if when you, whatever was put on your computer or if any files may have been accessed. The only thing I can add to that is uh, what I mentioned earlier in my presentation. Um, depending on the type of fraud that you are or that you've been victimized to, have a look at that Canadian Anti Fraud Center website, and it will lead you on things that you should do. It'll it, it'll guide you. Uh, on on the on the type of fraud maybe that you've experienced. Okay. Uh, here's a question that I'll leave open to whoever might know this one. Uh, this person uh, 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 sold something to uh, uh, someone, and uh, uh, he sh he showed her that she had done an e-transfer to her. Then the lady saw it in her bank, but when the buyer left, apparently he canceled the e-transfer. And when they uh, went checked again, the, the payment was gone. And she wants to know why do banks have this e-transfer cancellation function? Isn't it actually helping the fraudsters? Um, I'm a little familiar with that one there, unless somebody else wants to jump in or, or by all no, means. No, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, so, so basically with the, what, what's going on there is, is um, is some people have their have their e-transfers set up that it uh, it does not go directly into their bank account. It goes and sits in their email waiting for a password. Uh, that that is some 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 uh, some have that, and uh, we suggest that you that you get rid of that. That you have your e-transfer go directly to your bank without requiring a password because your bank account is generally more secure than your email account. Now, for the example possibly that the, uh, that the requester is, is making here, it sounds like uh, possibly they sold something on, a, on, a, on, a, on basically a classified, an online classified uh, uh, place, and, and, the, and the person uh, e-transferred them something. Now, as far as I know, the major banks do not allow the sender of the money to cancel their 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 e-transfer. Unfortunately, there are some credit unions that do allow you within I don't know 20 minutes or half an hour to cancel that e-transfer. So although it looks like it sat in the uh, in the account of of the person that sold it, it immediately or, or within minutes is pulled back uh, by by the scammer. Now that's that's unfortunate. Uh, the, the way around that, of course, is to, uh, is to is wait an amount of time before the, the, the good is transferred over uh, if you're using e-transfer. Otherwise, insist on cash. Cash is king. Great. All right. Well, thank you. We've got, uh, we're running out of time. We just have one more question uh, now, and, but I will repeat to everyone who's listening and watching, if you have further questions, uh, you can uh, uh, send them either directly to one of our uh, participants. We'll set, when we uh, send out the link to this recording, we'll include the contact uh, information where appropriate so you can continue to ask, uh, ask questions or you can send them directly to the CARP Nova Scotia chapter and we'll make sure they get to the appropriate uh, people. The final question, and I'll leave this, uh, I think like all three of you to comment uh, on this one because I think it's a, a really good one to finish off on. This person says, it's easy to put the onus back on the victim, but what's happening at the government level to address this issue. So uh, David, why don't we start with you and then uh, Lisa and Andrew. I, I think uh, when it comes to 
investment fraud, especially around crypto fraud in the last five, six months, we've taken uh, like a, a considerable public approach to try and get the message out there as much widely as possible uh, through our alerts, through our media uh, promotion, through online promotion to let people know about these scams. Uh, that was, as Andrew said earlier, the best way to help people to avoid them is by educating them about how the, what they are how to spot them. Uh, so especially around our commission anyway, that's, I can't speak to other areas of government, unfortunately, but what we've been doing is again, trying to educate people as best as possible to get the word out there among people through, uh, through helpful presentations like this. So again, thank you for the invitation to let people know what's happening out there, let them know some of the warning signs to spot, and not only to let them know, but to share it with your family members, share it with your friends, because uh, that's the easiest way, unfortunately, to protect people. Andrew, do you want to tackle that one? Yeah, sure. I, I, I mean, I, I think it's clear where, where, where my feelings are in this here issue. Um, folks, we are not going to police our way out of this problem. The problem is too huge. Uh, we're, we're finding the persons uh, responsible for, the, for, for this, for the most part, are, are located all over the world. In, in countries where where we have absolutely no power, I mean, we can look at uh, we can look at uh, you know uh, uh, things that happened in the past where we had a couple of people who were who were basically kidnapped or in in countries, and it took took us years to to get those persons out. So when we try to get information on on money that was sent into into many of those countries, we're just hitting a brick wall. So they. There's, there's just there's just no end. If some people feel that this here issue should be solved by the government or by the police, boys, I, you're going to be disappointed. I'm I'm unhappy to say uh, that the only solution that that I can see, the only way out, is that we have to educate ourselves, and and that just doesn't mean me and David and Lisa educating you. That means you now taking what you've learned here today and sharing it with people in your lives, whether it's your children, whether it's your parents, whether it's your siblings, whether it's your friends, colleagues, all of those, have these here discussions, encourage people to, to partake in forms that we're having here today and spread the word and educate ourselves and arm ourselves with this here knowledge that, that is being presented and put on the table here today. That's that's uh, that's all I can suggest there. I know it's not I know it's not the answer that some people are are looking for. They're looking maybe for the police maybe to solve this here problem for them. Uh, and I'm I'm very very sad to say that uh, it, it's just not going to happen. It it just ain't. And 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 maybe some people are give some joy to hear that and it makes them say, oh yeah, well this is the police problem. Um, but it, it it's a huge problem, folks. It, it really really is. And if some of these here scams that uh, that Lisa and Dave were talking about, you said the romance scams. I, I've I've been heartbroken year after year and seeing the results uh, that that the, those crimes there, uh, 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 the effect on the people and how it alters their lives and and not not only financially but mentally and and everything else that goes along with it and, and as well as their families. So. Um, I, I hope everybody can share the information that they've, any nuggets that they've picked up today, share them with people in your lives. Okay, Lisa, a final word from uh, you, and you deal very closely with people in a, in a smaller community, these issues. Uh, uh, what, what's your view on the, the government solving all these problems uh, for us? I think it's really, it's easier to prevent something than to trace something back. Um, and as the consensus here is, it's it's just too big, it's too huge, and there's it's worldwide. Like the scammers are worldwide; they're not in most of them are not in the country, this country. Um, so prevention is the key, and as hard as that is to accept, um, just taking a, t a little bit of time of being curious time to process what you're hearing, what you're seeing. Um, is this true? Is this, could this too be true? Is it too good to be true? Sorry. Um, ask yourself some questions. And then if you are unfortunately a victim of a scam, let other people know and do report it because it does make a difference. Knowing what's out there, have, being able to take larger amounts of information, the same information is easier than little bits and pockets of pieces of it. 
I don't, I, and support, don't be surprised or don't be, um, don't be ashamed if you are victimized by a scammer. It's, it can happen to anyone. It's not about how smart you are um, because they play on the emotions and they spend every waking moment trying to think of creative ways to separate us from our money. Um, they try to catch us off guard uh, in heightened sense of emotion. So if you are unfortunately a victim of a scam, seek out support because you're not going to be judged for it. Great. Good. Well, thank you, uh, Lisa, very much. And thank you, all three of you for me. There, there are a number in the chat of uh, people saying thank you. They really appreciate this presentation today. But I'll turn it back to uh, Ray, uh, to Roy Hayward. Roy, I'll ask you to close it off, please, when you unmute yourself. Oh. Roy is unmuting him. There he is. Yeah. Yes, it's been uh, most enlightening and interesting for me, and I hope so for everybody else. Uh, especially want to thank the three panelists for showing up today. And as uh, Bill said, this will be on our website. And uh, you want to check it out again or show it to your friends. So I thank you all for participating. And on behalf of CARP Nova Scotia, thank you. And good afternoon. Thank, Thank you, Roy. Thank you, everyone.